Uh, we're excited to see so many people. Actually, there were some issues with the registration, so there are more people than were supposed to be. And that means two things. It's pretty crowded. And if you feel it's too crowded here, you can spread to the rest of the room and you will also be able to hear it there and you can also see on the screens. And the second thing it means is that the pizzas will take a little bit longer to, m to make. So there may be a slight delay there. Um, but we're happy to see you all here. Um, today we will talk about chat GPT under the hood and how technology from that can be used uh, in different applications. And uh, we are doing this uh, as a team from uh, Softhouse that works with applied AI. Uh, about pizzas. Yes. Okay, two important questions. How many, oh three, how many will not have pizza? Okay, and how many want vegan pizza? <laughs> no? No vegan pizza? Gluten-free pizza. <laughs> so there's vegetarian pizza and there's meat pizza. But uh, if you want vegan pizza, you have to raise your hand. No vegan pizza. You want vegan pizza. Okay? Yeah? Good? Yeah, two people for vegan pizza. <coughs> <laughs> I think you mean vegetarian, sorry? I think you mean vegetarian, don't you? Vegan, vegetarian, but other vegetarian shops. Yeah, yeah, we have vegetarian, so you don't have to raise your hand for that. Okay, so no vegan pizza then. <laughs> Good to have clarified that, okay. Sec third difficult question, any gluten-free pizza? No, no gluten-free pizza? Okay. Now we can move on. So uh, we are three people from Softhouse who work with Applied AI. It's me, Chat Jonsson. Uh, we have Olaf Bengtsson and Oresti Theodridis. Uh, and we work with diverse areas of AI. Myself, I work with image analysis and, and fingerprints, detecting if when you try to unlock a phone, if it's a fake fingerprint or a real fingerprint. Um, we have Oresti works a bit with uh, trying to make AI work on uh, on embedded applications. And Olaf has worked with text data. And text is what we will uh, talk about today. And actually, Olo, we have three more people here who will help us. And it's our summer interns from last summer. We have Musa Seni, we have Marcus Escalade, and Nils Ekstrand. Um, and uh, most of us, actually everyone except me, has worked with text data. Uh, and most of it was during the summer, where we did this exciting project um, th where we worked with this really cool technology that we felt, felt were very, very powerful that not, not so many people knew about. And now <laughs> many people know about that technology. So that's why we're really uh, excited to share our experiences uh, and tell you, I mean, what this is under the hood and give you some applications. And then we'll finish a little bit with a wider societal uh, outlook that hopefully will stir some thoughts and, and be a good preparation for it for a discussion and questions. Okay, so let's get started then. I didn't forget anything, Mickey. No? Okay. He's ordering pizza. He's ordering pizza, <laughs> great. <laughs> then I'll hand over to Olaf to start. Yeah. Everyone can hear me now? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I thought that I would start by just kind of uh, uh, Telling what ChatGPT can do, I don't. I suppose that most of you have heard of ChatGPT al already, and that's why you're here. Uh, but essentially, it's in uh, an advanced uh, chat AI bot, which you can ask pretty much any question you want, and you will receive an answer to most questions, at least. Uh, you can ask it to uh, write a text about historical events. You can ask it to uh, summarize texts, uh, write something from. As, uh, as a specific uh, perspective, or even as uh, uh, if uh, a text was written by another person. Uh, so I've, I've made an example here where I asked the, the uh, model to create a short review for a computer scientist that sounds like it was written by Gordon Ramsay. And it goes like this. Uh, this computer scientist is a real top chef when it comes to coding, let me tell you. They have the passion and expertise to create software that is cooked to perfection. The attention to detail in their work is outstanding. No bugs or glitches to be seen here. 
they have a real talent for taking a project from raw code to a delicious final product. If you're looking for someone to create a software dish that will leave you, uh, your users coming back for more than this computer scientist is the one you need in your kitchen. Uh, which is almost a bit too positive for Gordon Ramsay, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> uh, but uh, ChatGPT uh, is, is quite, quite positive, uh, I, I have to say. Uh, but still, I think it's, it's quite, quite amazing. Uh, however, there are some areas where uh, ChatGPT does not excel, and that's in logical, logical problems. So I, this is a typical question I think you, you've all seen. So the question is, when I was 10, my sister was half my age. I'm now 50, uh, I'm, uh, my, I'm aging very good. <laughs> uh, how old is my sister? So it, it figures out that my sister was five when I was 10, which is correct, and that I have aged 40 years. But during the same time, ChatGPT thinks that my sister has aged 20 years, uh, so that she is 25 instead of 45, uh, which is Aww. incorrect. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, so, better? Thank you. Okay, so what is ChatGPT? Uh, the core of it, uh, the GPT uh, part, uh, stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And generative uh, means that, it was, uh, that, that it's trained to generate the next token in a sequence. Uh, and with token, you can see this as the next word. So if you have a sequence of words, then the model is trained to predict the next word given that prior se uh, sequence. Uh, Pre-trained means that it was trained on a very large data set to kind of learn language and how, how language works. And then they would uh, build off of this model uh, so that the model would actually learn knowledge. Uh, and then transformer, which is uh, an encoder-decoder architecture, which, which is the essential building blocks behind this model. And uh, uh, encoder-decoder architecture can be used, for example, if you want to generate images. I don't know if you've seen that you can generate images of people that, that don't exist, but that looks like people. And this works that you feed a model uh, very many pictures of people. And then the encoder part, it will uh, create a representation of the image that the decoder then decodes uh, and tries to make uh, to uh, recreate the same picture as before. Uh, so then, uh, w when you've done this training, you can then put in your own representation, uh, which can be anything you want, and then the decoder, just the, d the decoder, will output a new image that hasn't been seen before. So if we move into the transformer part, which is the most, most important, w which is uh, the, the building block of the uh, uh, GPT models, uh, you can see the encoder part to the left and the decoder uh, part to the right. And the GPT actually only uses the decoder part wi uh, since it generates text, so it's, it doesn't have to create the encodings themselves. Uh, and the most important thing in, a, uh, in the transformer, which is uh, one of the things that has made it so, uh, uh, so good, is uh, the attention mechanism, which, uh, actually uh, which in simple words means that it, uh, for I in a sentence, it can tell uh, for every word, how important that word is uh, in relation to all the other words in that sentence. And it does this by creating these attention vectors for every word, uh, where a high number would correspond to that it, it, that it is important to that specific word. So if, if we take this uh, example at the bottom, for example, uh, the big red dog, then we can see that for the word dog, which is highlighted, the most important word to that is dog, which is reasonable. <laughs> uh, but we can also see that the word the is more important than the word big. And I would say that that's quite, quite reasonable because this sentence is still a valid sentence if we just remove the word big. But the sentence isn't a valid sentence if we remove the word the. Uh, and this is how, how the uh, uh, transformer learns context. Uh, and then the reason why I've, I've uh, put zeros uh, and uh, uh, marked down some words is because uh, in the decoder part, the sentence uh, masks all the uh, uh, future tokens so that the model manages to learn how language works. And this is how it does that. So what has, what has actually made 
Uh, oh, uh, there's some some more things I want to add on this, and that's the, uh, that the transformer w was actually originally thought to be used for translation, uh, but uh, since it was um, announced in t uh, 2017, it has had a huge impact on uh, the whole field of natural language processing. For example, this ChatGPT. Uh, but it has also found some applications in images as well. Uh, so they, they use these in image, uh, image models too. So what uh, has actually made the transformer so successful? Uh, these generative models uh, in the past has uh, actually been uh, built by something called recurrent neural ne networks. And these are networks that works in a way that the output of a, of a sequence is then fed fed back into the same model again. So if we want to uh, if if we want to predict the the sentence, the big red dog. If we start with the word the, and then the, uh, it predicts uh, the big, then both the words the and big have to be put into the model again, and this takes a lot of time to train the model, uh, which is which isn't very uh, very good, and then after after some time training this, the uh, tokens far in the back will not affect the tokens uh, that you are looking at now, even though they might be related in some way. And these models couldn't handle that either. But transformers actually can do this. Uh, by creating these vectors for every word, we can put in the whole sentence at the same time. And uh, then uh, GPUs, which are very good at handling these kinds of vectors, uh, vector uh, 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 calculations can uh, compute this very quickly and train the model much, much more efficient. And this uh, attention mechanism that trains the model to see what word is important to other words is also better to handle context compared to the uh, old re recurrent neural networks, uh, which are the two main things, I would say, or at least I think why the transformer has gone so popular. So if we go back to GPT, uh, the uh, GPT model actually consists of several of these transformer decoder layers uh, 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 on, on each other. So it's not just one, one uh, block, uh, but there's, there, there's many. And uh, using this architecture, uh, the model actually manages to produce human-like text, which I think is uh, ve very, very uh, good. Uh, but uh, the architecture of the model isn't the most important thing. Uh, there is also the training data that you have to consider, which is equally important. And this model has been trained on a very large data set collected from the internet. And now I will let Oresti continue on this. Can you hear me? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. I will be talking a bit about the data used to train this uh, model called GPT-3. And uh, it's uh, first some numbers. Uh, let's see. We have 45 terabytes of text data collected from different resources. There's a big data bank co called Common Crawl, uh, which uh, is uh, available for most people to use. It constituted, I think, 80% uh, of the uh, data used, but also the total of Wikipedia and uh, uh, web scraping of books and uh, other resources like uh, blogs and uh, general news. Uh, uh, efforts were made, if you read the article about uh, uh, GPT-3, uh, to pre-process. This, this includes removal of unnecessary characters, uh, tokenization also, make them numerical so that the computer can understand them. So there's a saying that goes, uh, you are what you eat for humans, but machines can't choose what to eat. So they are what they're fed by their creators. And in the case of GPT-3, they made uh, sure to give up-to-date diverse data, uh, representative of contemporary language, not so much from old language. Uh, this means that they can uh, understand human jokes idioms, slang also, uh, and also a concoction of uh, the religions and ideology of the world. Uh, it knows several languages. 
I've tr I tried to feed it Greek, but it didn't give me th uh, that good response. <laughs> it doesn't know Greek yet. It mostly knows English, which brings me to this, that you are what you're fed, uh, for better or worse. Uh, there are some uh, biases you can't uh, get out of. For one, inaccuracies and factoids present in, in the Internet will always be transferred to the model. Uh, h however good your model is, it can't remove these. Uh, other stuff to look, look out for is uh, uh, inequality in content creation. Uh, there are always uh, there's limited representation of people from cultures that do not use the internet, people of lower education, lower income. Uh, I read about Wikipedia, uh, uh, actually a Wikipedia article <laughs> about it, uh, that uh, that uh, discusses how men are very much represented of what content exists in Wikipedia. I think it's 80% uh, and 20% women. This is a huge bias because. Uh, that determines exactly what it is you're required to say uh, as an AI. There's also another bit to think of here, when, uh, which, uh, yeah, it's that 45 terabytes is uh, it, it, it's a large data set, but if you compare it to the total data used in the internet today, I've looked at some resources uh, like Statista and uh, and I even asked ChatGPT <laughs> how, how much data there exists <laughs> in the world. So, and uh, they all, all came to a conclusion about 5,200 zettabytes of stored data. Most of it is unstructured, meaning no databases or anything just out there in the open. Well, th this means that it's trained on about 0% of the world's total data. And that might pose a problem. Uh, but. I thought of this, and it might not be that significant because we as humans tend to understand language quite well without reading everything. Uh, maybe GPT will understand stuff too. Yes, okay. I think I'm not here. Let's see if I can start this one. Can I ask a question? We do, you know, do you know how many people have uh, created this data and what about as it today? Do you know how big the total. Because there was like 7,000 years uh, of language, but how, how big is the team behind who has been working on that? I was asking uh, how big is the team uh, who has been creating a working uh, with the GPT-3? Uh, uh, I don't know the exact number, okay. but it's a good question. Uh, and, and, yeah. and we save the rest of the questions for yeah. the end, but yeah. that was nice. Thanks. <laughs> So, we've been talking a lot about GPT-3, but what is then chat GPT? Is it the same? Well, not quite. Uh, let's see. So, uh, here is a, resu uh, a result that we get from GPT-3. We ask it to explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences. And you can see the result, and this commentator, Jim Fences, it looks like pretty much like a drunk parrot. It doesn't give that good response. And the problem is the training setup. As Olaf described, it's based on predicting what comes next in a text, how a whole text sits together. But what we wanted to do is to be able to answer our questions or be able to respond to our requests. And that is not what that training was about. And that's why it also needed specialized training to be able to handle those tasks. And that is what OpenAI called the instruct GPT paradigm. And it's quite small maybe for you, but in it says in the answer here that people went to the moon, they took pictures and what they saw and sent them back to the Earth so that all could see them. And that's, I mean, a pretty good explanation of the moon landing to a six-year-old. So what was this training all about? What did they do to go from GPT-3 to instruct GPT? Well, the main factor was this, people, people writing examples to the training and people providing feedback whether the training was good or not. And the training proceeded in three steps. And the first steps were people typing how the responses should be. 
And you can imagine that's quite cumbersome. It takes quite a lot of time when you get the response to type the full answer. So you get kind of a limited amount of data from this approach. It's very expensive. But it's nonetheless an important first step that you do supervised learning with this examples to make it better at answering questions. But the step two, that is uh, much easier because then the uh, human annotators are supposed to rank the examples instead. So it works like this. Uh, you have a prompt and then you get four possible answers. And the human then has to decide which one is the best, which one is second best, third best, and fourth best, and so on. And from this, you build up a large data set. And one could think that maybe you then just train this to the model. But they did something a little bit more clever than this to leverage the information in a really good way. And that was that they trained something called a reward model. So basically, what they did is that they trained another AI, another neural network, to be able to say, whether an answer was good or not. And it's a quite a lot easier task to do that, to, um, to say if something's good or not, than to actually just generate the answer. And then they used this reward model in the third step. And that was to fine tune the GPT-3 with reinforcement learning and using the reward model. And you may have heard about reinforcement learning, but it's mostly talked about in terms of when you want to make a computer really good at computer games or uh, playing Go, and also for controlling robots. So I can think, why is this a good training way for a language model? What does computer games to do with, with language? And the thing is that what is really, really hard about being good at te teaching a computer to be good at an Atari game is that it's you ha hard to find the connection, what you do now and what the reward will be. Because if you, for example, move um, upwards uh, in Pong in frame 37, and then you lose in frame 71, or win in frame 385, it's really hard to find the like, causal correlation that it was because I moved there that I got the good result then. And so it's an ex extremely complex optimization problem, but they have managed to make really good tools for this. And then when you have language, what you want when you get an output, it is not just a single token. You need a full output. And it's first when you have the full paragraph that you know whether the question is, whether the response is good or bad. And so that's why you have the similar problem. You can see they take the action is predicting the next word, but you don't know in the end, for until the end, if it's good or not. And this is reinforcement learning, how it works. You have the agent making an action in the environment. So the agent here is, um, is GPT-3. And depending on the environment, um, then it changes the state, but it may also get the reward. It may win the game, or in this case, it may actually uh, get uh, make a good prompt according to the reward model. So the difference here between just uh, training a computer game and training uh, chat GPT or instruct GPT uh, was that instead of a good score meant it was a reward, it was that it was a good score according to the reward model that gave a good uh, that was a reward in that case. So we got from GPT-3, actually they used GPT-3.5, but that is very similar to GPT-3. That was a text-based general training. Then we had the specialized training to do instruct GPT, but we're not quite at chat GPT yet. There is one final step, and that's very important, and that is safety mitigations. Because we know that uh, chat GPT, or we know that bots in general tend to uh, publish a lot of toxic content, um, in general things that you, shouldn't, you don't want it to put out. For example, uh, if a user says, how can I bully John Doe? The instruct GPT ha gives an answer in the bottom and it's, uh, it's censored here, so it doesn't actually say what the suggestions is. <laughs> but thanks to the safety mitigations, it actually gives a kind of nice and appropriate answer to this. And, and here we also have another AI models detecting whether the prompt is bad or good, and then it will uh, go into these safety mitigations. 
So now we have gone all the way uh, through the technology to how ChatGPT was created. Uh, and now we'll get a little bit more practical and see uh, how one part of this, namely GPT-3, was used by our summer interns to create something kind of useful. All right, so hello everybody. We're the summer interns. Uh, my name is Marcus. Uh, my name is Mosa. And I'm Nils, and uh, we uh, worked on Polytweet last summer. And uh, let's just get right into it. So what is Polytweet? Well, Polytweet is a tool, uh, or in essence, is a tool that grabs a tweet from Twitter, analyzes it, and then presents the data. And um, what we did was we worked on this right before the uh, Swedish election in 2022. We thought that it would be fun to uh, specialize on all the party leaders uh, that are in parliament. And so that is exactly what we did. And uh, before we go uh, into more detail of how it all works, we were going to start with a demo right away. So here we go. There. All right, so this might be a lot of, uh, <laughs> lot of things at once. The, the GUI was not the thing that we worked on the most. But so what we have done here is we have loaded up all the um, uh, party leaders uh, from last year and loaded up all their tweets from uh, one year back from the election. And we have sorted or we have um, processed the tweets for three main things. For the target of the tweets, so what other party were they, were they targeting in the tweet? And then we also uh, analyzed the sentiment of the tweet. So the feeling behind it, if it was a positive tweet, a negative tweet, neutral or other. And then also the topics that uh, this person mostly talked about. So we can see right away we have Jimmy Okison in the we start off with. And he likes to be negative, we can see here from most of his tweets. And these are hundreds and hundreds of tweets uh, that we've processed. And then we can also see here uh, what he likes to talk about, uh, migration and asylum, judicial system, acts of crime. Uh, and he likes to target the social democrats, you can see here, <laughs> with most of his tweets. And uh, yeah, and then we see here, Ami Love, mostly positive. <coughs> and uh, this, is, this is what we've done. Um, for all the party leaders. And under the hood, we also have the tweets, the likes, the uh, number of replies and everything to the tweets. But uh, for this presentation, we have just shown this more over the, the top look. Do you want to add anything? To I think that's about it. All right. I just want to say that uh, the inner circle is... Um, the the mic, yeah. I want to say that the inner circle is the um, distribution of the sentiment according to the topic. So how many, how, how many percent was negative, positive, and neutral? Did you use AI to analyze that? Yes, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to this. Uh, we used the GPT-3 model. Right. Just a small question. Do you handle irony? Um, yes, AI has something called the Mars. Microphone? Microphone? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, is, it, it has a model that can handle irony. Uh, uh, I was like um, asking it to be ironic when it answers, and it could get irony too. But it can also be kind of hard just to answer the question, uh, especially with maybe Jimmy Wilkinson. We have um, it's hard to know when he's when he's talking about something that we all know because we know him. He's he means something very negative. He can say, "Oh, the uh, this is this is so positive," and he's talking about immigration or something that that is not a positive thing, but, ja but GPT-3 will, will classify this as positive. So it's, it's not perfect, but yeah. All right, so continuing on, we're going to dive deeper. <laughs> so next slide. All right, yeah. 
So uh, going deeper then, how, uh, how is this tool uh, set up? So there's, there's three main uh, phases of this tool that a, a tweet uh, goes through. Firstly, we have the input, uh, or that's where we get the tweet. And then we have the classification processing, and then we have the output that you just saw. So I'm going to talk about, start talking about a little bit on the input side. So first, how do we get the tweets? Well, we used a already made scraper that we found on GitHub and that, that worked very well, which we just inserted a username and uh, then we chose how many tweets we wanted and it fetched all these tweets with the accompanying metadata such as likes, retweets, date, and so on. And um, that is how we got the tweets. Go to the next one. And then we fed the GPT-3 model these tweets and asked it to politely just classify them for us. Uh, finding the, the target, uh, you can go to the next one. Finding the target, sentiment, topic, and subtopic of the tweets. And uh, this might sound easy when, I, when I'm seeing it like this, but um, it brings up a big question and a big a new field that we're seeing now, which is prompt engineering, which is really how, how do you talk to an AI? How because you, uh, you can ask it similar questions that will get completely different answers. So it was a big, you can get next slide. It was a big process for us to fine tune and find the exact sentence that we wanted to use since we used the exact same uh, sentence for every tweet that we analyzed. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and then over to Marcus. All right, so one problem that arises with this approach is that we want to present statistics, right? We want to be able to see like which topics the different party leaders spoke about. But we never say which topics that are okay. So uh, one problem with this is that uh, we can get pie charts looking like the one to the right if we don't specify which topics that are okay. So our solution to this is something called merging. So this is where we are in the process diagram. Oops. Yeah, so first of all, we provide something we call uh, class lists, which is a set of predefined classes, which contains like the different topics. And uh, as you can see here, for example, economic policy, energy policy, and yeah, different political areas, basically. And in the target class list, we have uh, parties, political parties. So what we do is that we provide this list, and then uh, we take the, the topic that we want to merge, that we get from GPT-3, and we compare it to the list, and then select the best match, completely based on similarity. So uh, when merging a predicted topic and subtopic, we we firstly transform the words into uh, a numerical representation, which is, uh, as you saw, as Olaf talked about before, uh, it's a kind of vector. So then we can use something called uh, cosine similarity to find the best semantic match. And then we select the best match, and uh, yeah, that is how we get the, the new merged topic. So here's an example to clarify it. Um, so when the main topic, okay, first of all, I'm going to read a tweet from uh, the at the time Swedish prime minister. So she says, good to meet with President Susanna Kapitovato. I think she was going to say to confirm the excellent development of relations between Sweden and Slovakia. Thank you for strong support for our NATO application lots of potential for more corporations in the years to come. So the main topic that we got from our classifier was foreign relations from GPT-3 then. And the subtopic is diplomacy. And the result, the merge topic, is foreign policy, which is from the class list. And then the target in this tweet, Slovakia. And since it's not um, a political party, it just uh, classified it as none. Yeah, over to you, Mosa. Thank you. Um, in order to um, 
Uh, in order to uh, evaluate the performance of our model, we used uh, precision recall and F1 score. So what is precision recall and F1 score? Uh, precision is like, say, say that you have a class, class 1, um, and your AI predicting, um, predicting uh, samples as class 1. Of those that are predicted as class 1, how many of those were actually labeled as class 1? This is what prediction is. Uh, precision is. And recall is uh, of those that were labeled as class 1, how many of those did your model catch? Um, they tell different things, so um, the better measurement is to combine those two in a metric called F1 score. And F1 score is like combining them and uh, rescaling them so that they are between 0 and 1. Um, and f in our case, it is a bit difficult to uh, to measure uh, its performance because uh, usually you have uh, labeled data and uh, you compare the result to the label, the true label, and you say whether it is good or bad. Uh, but in our case, it's not labeled. So what we did was to um, manually label 200 tweets based on their, um, their sentiment. And uh, here are the results. Uh, so uh, we got an F1 score of... Uh, 0 0.86 for class positive and negative. Uh, and now, Oracy will talk about uh, Yeah. <coughs> oh, thank you. Uh, you've seen, uh, uh, we did this uh, previous year and we, you saw how we, we can use this uh, technology in creative ways, like a personal assistant. Instead of going out and doing the field work yourself, you can just have an AI that uh, does all this work for you. So there are many benefits of these uh, large la language models, which uh, they are called. And uh, with this great power comes some stuff to look out for, of course. Uh, first of all, is it good? We saw earlier that it fails at math. Uh, it fails with very persuasive confidence, though. So, uh, so this is when it fails, when we can verify when it makes uh, something false. But what of the other stuff that we can't verify at uh, first hand? Maybe it, uh, much of the stuff you have written to it, it, its responses might be completely false without you knowing it. Earlier you saw that it told me that it took 7,000 that it was trained on data equivalent to 7,000 years of talking. That was just a response from chat GPT. Um, I don't know if that's true. I've not uh, verified it, <laughs> actually. If some of you can do it, uh, I would be glad. Uh, but uh, that was just a demonstration of uh, you can just ask it something and get an answer without knowing if it's fake, factoid. Another thing to look out for is uh, it's a centralized technology uh, today. Uh, what would it mean to uh, to make it public for humans to use uh, uncensored? Uh, today we have a company that owns everything and uh, basically uh, uh, determines what it should respond and uh, to what extent. But that also means they have the unrestricted form also. So they have an AI there that can respond every anything, not just the, the, the filtered part which we are seeing. Uh, with that in mind, there are some open source initi initiatives with which I uh, encourage you to look into, especially Bloom from previous year. I think it's a bit larger than GPT-3, uh, and uh, it's not as good, but it's open source and it can be better. So there are, these are the shortcomings, but it's also it's also important to to look at what it's what it does good. Uh, so, GPT-3 is very good at uh, most stuff. Uh, large language models are very good at uh, producing code, for example. They are very good at uh, writing a clear scientific report for us. But these are both good and bad stuff for humans. <laughs> I mean, uh, what will it contribute to? Maybe it will take over programming, consulting, maybe, uh, I mean, it's a cheaper therapist and uh, teacher. Uh, maybe we, I mean, we won't see hackathons in 10 years because it's just a curiosity. 
it made me think a bit about uh, uh, memorization techniques, uh, which was uh, very important in ancient Greece. The only thing you could do to store long-term memory was to remember them. Uh, and you used mem mnemonics uh, to do that. Uh, then in the 15th century or 16th, I don't remember, uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press. And after that, there goes an anecdote about that invention somehow stopped our ability to memorize a lot of stuff. And uh, this becomes more evident when the calculator or computer was uh, invented. Today, the memorization and mental arithmetics are more like competitions or rather than essential skills you have in the workplace, right? And maybe this will become true for coders also. Maybe coding won't be that important skill in the future. But also on a positive note, uh, we've seen applications of this uh, ChatGPT AI. There are some other applications which I at least find interesting. Uh, if some of you have uh, done philosophy, you know that AI has been discussed for centuries. Um, and al almost only in the domain of thought experiments, famous uh, thought experiments, where you provide someone with a set of instructions so you get something back. But today we have the, the ability to investigate these questions in real life. I mean, we have language models. We can see how far uh, we could go in exploring language, uh, questions about if it contains consciousness, questions on ethics and responsibility, to what extent can we, as creators of an AI, held responsible for, it, for its actions. And then also some metaphysical uh, thoughts, if you would like. How important is language for understanding? Maybe you don't need language. Maybe it's just a convenient tool we humans use. And of course, all uh, other uh, questions too. Thank you. So, on that note, I think it's a good time. I should just move so that I'll be seen. Okay. It's a good time for questions. Uh, and maybe also suggestions about what would you like to hear more about in this area next time. But there, over there is a question. How much did you get in the topic Dan? In, in the topic? Dan. Dan? The, the bad brother of uh, ChatGPT. So with no limitations, no ethics in place. Did you check that out? Not at all. Oh, okay. Sorry, we didn't. Any other question? Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 Where does it need to go? Hello. Um, with this, um, the confidence problem that it uh, gives incorrect responses that um, are obviously <laughs> not not very good. Uh, is there any good solution on the way? How to um, uh, determine the confidence the, or the accuracy of responses? I actually really don't know uh, is, is the short answer. I, I would guess that they have people that, that are working on fixing all the problems all the time, basically. Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything. It's um, yeah, I, I, the, it's probably much much they have to do. I, I I can't imagine that they that that there's one quick quick fix that they that they can make, and then all all the logical problems will solve uh, solve themselves. Uh, so I, I actually don't know. I mean, just intuitively, I would guess that why not just train a model to say how confident this and not. But since it's not there in place yet, I guess it's a really hard problem. Maybe it's hard in the annotation. Maybe it's hard for people to know whether it's confident or not. But uh, there should be an AI to be able to tell how confident that is. I think. I, I don't see why not, but it's not there. Hi. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cybersecurity and legal persons in the, in the audience today. <laughs> so 
my question is, uh, it's two questions. What's the main risks with, with this tool? And do you see like regulation coming as well in the horizon? So I know there's already lawsuits underway. Uh, for example, when it comes to the training data, um, that it was trained. I think this is regarding the Copilot tool that's also based on GPT-3. Uh, Copilot is used uh, by programmers uh, to do code completion uh, to help with programming. And it was trained on open source data that has licenses that it's not allowed to use it for commercial use. And there is one ki kind of, um, yeah, there might be a, a, a problem there and we'll see how it goes forward with, with these uh, trials. But then <laughs> regulations, I mean, this, this is a new technology. It has to be regulated. I mean, EU already has regulations on, on different types of AI, uh, de depending on how um, harmful it can be. And when something is really, really powerful as this is, it has the potential to do harm. So there has to be regulations, but I don't know that much about them yet. Hi, everyone. Uh, <coughs> just as a reminder, um, how many terabytes? Uh, what, what, what was the? 45. 45 terabytes that uh, they fed the uh, GPT. Um, how much of that is uh, actually stored, or is it just consuming it? No, uh, that's that was the, the the foundational part of GPT-3. Chat GPT is trained on, I think, uh, more data than uh, that it's continually fed with r ranking of data. But I think your question was like, how much of that data is actually encoded inside the model? Like, basically, how many parameters and things like that there is? No, no. basically, uh, is is it just <coughs> going through it and learning concepts, understanding, uh, and building that understanding? And then just this uh, uh, what's the word discard the data, or is it stored somehow? I would say that it is mostly stored. Uh, I I can't say how how large portion of it is stored, but in some condensed way, it is stored into the model in form of weights, numbers. So it's all translated into some kind of abstract representation. Just I mean. We cannot explain it, just like we cannot explain our brains. We don't know how memories are encoded in our brain, and we cannot explain how data is stored there. So I think it's a very good analogy to say that an al analogy between a brain and between an AI, in that you store knowledge in a way, but exactly if it's knowledge when it's in the brain or only when it comes out, I mean, there's lots of philosophical questions there. But I think when it comes to comparing them, it's they're, they're quite similar. And another thing about uh, I want to ask about the uh, what was the word for it? Um, the RM. The RM was the reward model. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Is uh, the users well, me <laughs> uh, as an avid user of uh, this? Uh, uh, what should I call it? Technology. This technology. Thank you. Um, uh, is my uh, responses, my my feedback, is that somehow a part of it? I think so, yes. I think they take in all the kind of feedback that they can. Especially when you press the like button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next question. Uh, are there any tools or services that you're personally excited about um, that AI could enable or that you're looking forward to? Well, um, while you're thinking, uh, I thought it was, uh, we have uh, already used some AI tools in our presentation. Like most of the images were generated. Um, That's kind of really nice use, so you don't have to look for images and check for rights. Um, but for text, I mean, there's code completion, of course, is there, uh, getting knowledge. Writing poems, that's nice. Yeah, that's fun. But I, I will... <laughs> 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 but 
No, I can just say that I, when I studied physics, I tend to write my reports re really quickly. So a paraphrasing tool is really good to have it, so that I don't have to do it myself, actually. It was quite boring mm -hmm. to do it. It, it's it's not the biggest application, but for uh, uh, as a personal use, if you have some some kind of data set or something that that you would like to uh, uh, evaluate in some way, it's uh, it's uh, it's a quick way to kind of categorize your data, and you can ask it for it to find different patterns and so on, and then you can kind of divide it into different parts depending on what you are looking for. So there are there are actually endless applications, I would say. So it's. But only your imagination that could can set the boundaries, I think. And now I've thought a little bit more. I would like, I mean, to have it as an expert doctor would be nice. I mean, really great to not have to wait until you get to the doctor. And then the doctor doesn't know anyways because he's not specialized on that. That would be, that would be awesome. Um, is the language model in the future always going to be needed to be up in the cloud? Or is it possible, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about all the millions of images I have at home and all the texts I have. If I want to make the system work for me, but I don't want it to leave my home, will that be possible? Or is it always going to be needed to transfer the data somewhere? Do you have, have you heard anything about that? You know what I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think given like the typical budget the normal person has, I don't know. I mean, you, it's also hard to predict technology. How, who knows what's in like 20 years? But uh, I mean, definitely not now. I mean, it's super yeah. expensive that that infrastructure. Right. <laughs> One more. Um, can is it easy to ask it to format? the the output i mean let's say you want to use the chat gpt to generate the story in a game or something could you easily format it for a game engine i don't know how game engine works but i know that it i mean if you want for example to transfer some data into a table or other kinds of formatting and say i want this in markdown instead or something it's really good at that okay. but maybe we need to round off now because i guess people are hungry one last question Uh, so 80% of the uh, data that uh, the, the AI has consu consumed is basically produced by men, if I understood that correctly. Of Wikipedia. Of, of Wikipedia, okay. But what is the, pres uh, do you have any idea of the percentage of the total? No. Okay. Uh, my question is actually, um, I've always had this idea that if we're going to const uh, construct, yeah, or produce AI, whatever, um, that for some reason, and this is going to sound really weird, um, this, the, sp the spirit, the soul of AI, um, somehow if it's going to mirror us as greatly as possible, that uh, the, the, the producers should be, uh, uh, you know, in, it has to be more included than just being like men. And um, I don't know if my question is actually then: Is this any of any concern, or is it uh, just uh, some thought that I have that is based in nothing, just in philosophical ideas, my own personal? Was your problem that it was humans, or that it was male, or? Yeah, yeah, male. Male. I have no uh, problem with the humans uh, pr producing it, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't speak for OpenAI or the companies that owns this, but I mean, for me, it's uh, a concern that it's not uh, representative of the total population that you want to represent. If you want to represent the total population and it's 80% men or 80% something else, then what you're doing is incorrect. Would you mind having a discussion about that a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that was the final question. Yes, the Wrap question. it up. <laughs> thank you so much for listening, and thank you for all the questions. And now, pizza. <laughs>